Good evening and welcome to the very first edition of Chicago Tonight Black Voices. It's part of WTTW News continued commitment to amplifying Chicago's diverse voices. I'm Brandis Friedman on the show tonight. All right, well, this is a ritual, so we got to try to bring back as much normalcy as possible. So cheers to a new school year. School's back in session, but not in the building. Some CPS students share their thoughts on the first week of virtual school. They put all those weapons on the table and wanted the public to infer that all of those weapons came from this school. A look back at the history of police in public schools. The local ties of the NFL's first black team president and how he plans to lead an organization through crisis. 80 years of art movements in this neighborhood. And arts correspondent Angel Edo takes us on a tour through the historic Bronzeville neighborhood. But first, it's been a tumultuous year for many Chicagoans. Black Chicagoans in particular have borne the blunt impact of the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020. But every year, many face the damaging force of systemic racism. There's no time like right now to take a closer look at the community that makes up 30% of the city's population and just as much of its history and culture. It's been called both an uprising and a reckoning. Thousands of protesters marching through the streets of Chicago in the summer of 2020, calling not only our cities, but the world's attention to their cries. While these protests were sparked by outrage over police brutality, this outcry is not new. Throughout our city's history, black Chicagoans have had to fight to make their voices heard. I have never seen, even in Mississippi and Alabama, mobs as hostile and as hate-filled as I've seen in Chicago. Systemic racism in housing, criminal justice, education, and social services narrowed opportunities for black Chicagoans. And the effects of these policies still ripple today okay. from health outcomes. The Auburn Gresham community is in a health desert. It's in a pretty expansive desert. It's in a food desert, a health desert, a housing desert. In North Lawndale in particular, I found that there had been seven uh, black suicides within a two mile radius. To the pervasive violence that plagues many of Chicago's black and brown communities. I struggle to make sense of the reckless gun violence that continues to take the lives of our young people throughout the city. Despite the city's challenges, Chicago is full of activists, organizers, professionals, business owners, doers who fill the city's rich culture. It builds morale to see people that look like you winning and making it. And answer the calls of their communities and consciences. I'm from like the west side of Chicago, pretty urban neighborhood, so I've seen a lot and been through a lot throughout my lifetime. But I want to actually be able to assist people out there now and help and save them. Everyone thinks we're all sitting here waiting for someone to come solve our problem. We're here trying to solve our problems, but we do need resources. Equity is an issue, but understand that we're prepared to implement those changes ourselves. The city first settled by a black man, inspired black icons like Ida B. Wells, James Baldwin, Harold Washington, Michael Jordan, Oprah Winfrey, and of course, the country's first black first family, Barack and Michelle Obama. This is our moment. We are and always will be the United States of America. And it continues to inspire the millions of others who call the city home. We are doing it ourselves. When we say take over, I mean we are doing it and not the city. So this is work of the residents. Once you start stepping outside your comfort zone, you can develop empathy towards the suffering of other people, right? And then you can develop compassion on top of that empathy to do something about it. In so many ways, Black Chicago is Chicago. Black Chicagoans have nurtured, built, and shaped the city's culture from its food to its music to its politics. Here on Chicago Tonight, Black Voices, we intend to also look to its future. Up next, how the first week of virtual school went for Chicago Public School students and the week's top stories. Chicago Tonight, Black Voices is made possible in part by Fifth Third Bank and by the support of these donors.
At Fit Third, we believe when diverse voices are heard and empowered, communities are made stronger, lives are made better, and the future holds greater promise for all. That's why we're proud to support Chicago Tonight Black Voices. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can drive change. Here's a look at some of the top stories from this week. 21 finalists have emerged from the 700 that applied for highly coveted licenses that will bring 75 new cannabis dispensaries to the state. But early feedback from some black lawmakers say the state's effort at social equity and diversifying who'd receive those licenses have fallen short. People with previous low level marijuana offenses in their background and their family members were supposed to have a leg up on receiving them. So were those who reside in areas most affected by the war on drugs. The state will hold a lottery sometime this month to finalize the new dispensaries. Mayor Lightfoot announces an expensive and lengthy plan to replace the city's decades-old lead service lines. Lightfoot's plan is a shift in policy compared to her predecessors and is designed to chip away at the problem over multiple decades. The total, could co the total cost could be $10 billion or more. About 400,000 Chicago homes are connected to these lead service lines since city law required lead pipes for about 100 years. Federal law banned the use of lead pipes in 1986 when it was discovered that they cause brain damaging toxins to leach into the water. And coming up this week, Cook County is hosting its second annual Racial Equity Week to focus on the need to advance racial equity, especially in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. The week kicks off with census action event and will include a town hall on environmental issues, film screenings and discussions, transportation roundtables and racial healing circles. And County Board President Tony Preckwinkle will join us here on Chicago tonight tomorrow to discuss Racial Equity Week, among other issues. Another top story this week was the beginning of the school year for thousands of Chicago public school students. CPS says that by Thursday, September 10th, more than 90% of CPS students logged in for the first week of remote learning. But after the virtual bell rang, some students reported encountering some bumps on their first day of school. Joining us to talk about their first week back at school are Faith Robinson, a senior at Westinghouse High School, Nasa Sutherland, a sophomore at Lincoln Park High School, Aldo Brown Jr., a senior at Kenwood Academy High School, and Kaya Black, a freshman at the University of Chicago Charter School, Woodlawn Campus. Welcome all of you to Chicago Tonight Black Voices. So first, let's start with uh, Chicago Public School CEO Janice Jackson. She told us on Chicago Tonight earlier this week that compared to other school districts, CPS's opening its first day was relatively smooth. Here's a little bit more of what she said. I would say it was a relatively smooth opening. Now, with that said, there are always going to be hiccups and things that you deal with on the first day of school. Um, that is some of the normalcy that we expect from a first day opening. But we were not met with the outages, the glitches, the hacking, and all the other things that some of our peers unfortunately had to contend with. So, uh, Kaya Black, let's start with you, please. How did your first day go? Um, my last name is Blake. Blake, pardon me. How, excuse me, tell me how your first day went, Kaya. Um, it went well. I kind of missed one class because, like, it was, like, my, like, I have a schedule, but their class didn't pop up on my schedule, so I missed it, missed their class. Nasa Sutherland, how about for you? How would you say your first day was? Um, i definitely say it was strange, but it was actually pretty nice. You said strange? Strange and nice. Strange and nice. In what way was it strange? Because you were at home on a computer? Yeah. I'm not really used to not seeing my friends or the teacher yet. OK. Well, I want to come back to that. Uh, Faith Robinson, let's let's talk about how your first day went. How would you say it was? Um, it was totally a different atmosphere. But it went better than I expected, though. What did you expect? Um, I expected it to be like very long, because we had to start from 8 AM to 3.15. But it went faster than I expected to go. And the teacher was very nice, and we did very fun activities online. It was really cool. Awesome. Aldo Brown, how about for you? How, how did your first day go? It was just real exhausting, looking at the screen for that long. Oh, I had a headache after the day was over. And to think, like, I had to do this for 10 more weeks, right? Real exhausting. Yeah. Um, did your teacher seem ready, Aldo? The teachers, they were ready, but they they have less classes than most of the students 
most students got eight classes a day where teachers only had like three, four, or five. How, uh, how would you describe your home setup? Uh, Nasa, let's ask you, like, do you have siblings at home and where are you doing your work? Yes, I have two siblings, um, two sisters, and I'm doing my work at my dining room table. <laughs> so what is it like sort of sharing the space, but also sharing the internet with a sibling? Um, the internet's pretty good, but definitely the space is a little weird because for me, I focus better in a quiet environment. And since I'm surrounded by both of my siblings now, it's definitely louder. And do the rest of you have siblings? And, and what's it like sharing that space with your brothers and sisters? I definitely have, I have, I don't know. It's just, it's very hard to deal, like deal with everybody being like all together and it's loud people in different classes and stuff like that. How do so, you? Yes, it's hard. Yeah, and right now we're looking at, it looks like a picture of you, Aldo, uh, um, on your computer. Um, you know, you're also an athlete, Aldo. What's been happening with regard to your football program and, and what does that mean for you? Well, we just found out um, that CPS, they're not allowing uh, small sports to uh, practice. So that really messes up the recruiting. And like the suburban schools, like their recruiting is gonna go much smoother since, you know, coaches are able to come out there, see them practice. So that makes it harder for you, obviously, to, to consider getting recruited. They get the first looks. Yeah. Um, Faith, how do you feel about school being remote? Like, do you hope that you can go back into your school one day? soon one day soon i certainly hope that we do go back because having a dog here he barks all day it's kind of difficult that's the part i really don't like but i really do hope to get back in school soon what about the rest of you nasa how about you um i definitely miss my friends and i miss seeing my teachers and since it is high school and i'm only a sophomore it would be really nice to make most of my high school memories definitely face to face with people do you, feel, do you feel like it's safe to return to the schools, to be around other people, that the schools are gonna be clean enough? Um, I feel like they do a good job of taking care of us, but right now I'd say not go back to school. Okay, um, and you know, before we're out of time, Aldo, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you have the last word here. You know, what are your hopes for the rest of the school year? Uh, I hope this is all over by the end of the first quarter. You get to go back for the rest of school year. Uh, I, you know, I'm a senior. I just want to have a graduation prom, all that type of stuff. Yeah, I'm sure it's probably it's a, a tough year for all of you. Okay, well, I want to thank all of you for joining us. Best of luck with the rest of the school year. Thank you. And up next, from the football field to the front office, meet the NFL's first black team president in a conversation we recorded earlier. It was the week before the March general elections. TV cameras followed Mayor Daley as he visited Tilden High School on the south side, where he said better security measures have cut school crime. Daley said Project Operation Safe, which places police officers in high schools and some grade schools, was a success because at the time police had made more than 7,500 arrests. Troublemakers are learning the hard way that a school is not a place where gang fights, drugs, or weapons will be tolerated. The news reports showed a table full of weapons as reporters told how metal detectors at Tilden High School had helped police recover more than 33 weapons. But the table had almost 60 weapons, which Lieutenant Thomas Byrne, commanding officer of the Chicago Police Department School Patrol Unit, said had been found in several public schools, not just Tilden. Tilden teachers say that they are outraged that they were used for what they consider a political stunt and by the media's unquestioning coverage. They put all those weapons on the table and wanted the public to infer that all of those weapons came from this school. And there were only 33 of those weapons. It left a very bitter taste. All they show were the few weapons, but the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kids that walk through those same devices with absolutely no problem they don't make TV news, therefore they're ignored. In 2011, Jason Wright chose an unusual path for a 28-year-old professional football player. He left behind a seven-year career in the NFL and a new contract offer to pursue his MBA at the University of Chicago School of Business and a career as a management consultant. 
Recently, Wright made another unexpected career pivot back into the professional football arena when he was named president of the Washington football team in August. And Washington football team president Jason Wright joins us now to talk about his new role. First, congratulations on that new gig. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. So, of course, you know, you're the president of a team that is going through this massive name rebranding because the previous name was deemed racist uh, and was racist. And that's just one of the problems. There is, of course, the sexual harassment scandal involving the team's owner, concerns about CTE, a social justice revolution happening right now. How are you preparing to lead the team and the staff through all of this? Yeah, he forgot COVID too. Um, oh, there's the pandemic. There, that. <laughs> there is a lot going on. There is a lot going on. Um, to, to me, a lot of these things are, they are very big challenges and especially uh, the allegations of sexual harassment and our ongoing independent investigation are, are, the, are, are the thing that I'm taking the most seriously uh, of all of them right now. Um, they are challenges, but they are also very much opportunities. You know, the, the opportunity to shift our culture to one that doesn't, that, that empowers and raises voices, that makes people feel like they have agency and they don't have to um, mute or hide parts of themselves to come to work, that's gonna lift an emotional burden on folks uh, that is a really beautiful thing and it's gonna give us more productivity and more innovation. You know, a new name or identity is a once in a generation decision that's gonna change the way this club faces the world, the narrative we bring to the world, the way we engage with fans, the way we do charitable work, um, you know, all of those things that are laid out as, you know, challenges are actually opportunities to make a big difference. And I'm motivated by impact. Uh, you have a lot of history in the Chicago area, of course, uh, an undergrad. You played on the team at Northwestern. You earned your MBA from Booth, as we mentioned earlier. How did your time and your education in Chicago influence, you know, the work that you would go on to do? Yeah, I think like, like most people, your undergrad story is one where you really form the way you see the world. And, you know, for me at undergrad at Northwestern, I had a great coach in Randy Walker who just really helped me grow up and become a responsible young man, frankly. Um, I had a group of folks around me in a great church there that gave me a spiritual foundation in the Evanston Vineyard Church there in the Chicago area. Um, and, and I had a chance to play, you know, people could argue whether or not Northwestern is a big stage. I think it is a big stage in Big Ten football of learning how to perform under pressure and balance multiple objectives of being a student and an athlete, which is really quite hard. That enabled me to do, you know, really good things when I bridged into my NFL career and beyond. Um, and, and then and at what, Chicago, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. sorry, I just wanted, it's okay. I just want to jump in because one of the things that you're doing now, obviously, is you are the first black NFL team president and you're only the fourth player to go on to becoming a team president. Two things, why do you think it took so long for a player to become or a black player to become a team president considering that 70% of players are black? Um, but also, why aren't more former players leading teams? Yeah, there, there just hasn't been a, a clear pipeline from the field to the front office uh, for, for a lot of various reasons, but especially for black folks on the field, I think you could cite a lack of role models. Um, I think for me, um, I didn't do this on purpose, but I happened to play for a black head coach. I happened to play for a black offensive coordinator. I had a black assistant head coach, you know, Romeo Cornell, Maurice Carthon, Anthony Lynn. I had a black general manager, Rod Graves. And when you see those role models that are one step beyond the field, subconsciously it tells you that black talent is valued and can excel in places that you normally don't see it. And so when this opportunity came to be, which is, was a bit serendipitous, um, I think that was part of what gave me the boldness to step into it. And so many people had come before me that put cracks in that proverbial glass ceiling that I was able to have a soft landing into this role. Now, in recent weeks, of course, we've seen a lot of athletes across many, several professional sports um, using their position to protest uh, racial injustice. And in some ways, they're, maybe they're not joining the protests on the streets, but they're certainly doing it in their respective arenas. What is your reaction to that? And, you know, what do you say to the people who say just stick to sports? Yeah, I think from the moment Colin Kaepernick was sitting and then chose to kneel after talking with uh, military veterans about a more respectful way to show his protest to today, athletes have driven a national, now actually global dialogue on racial disparities, starting with criminal justice, but it's become much more broad than that, including the work I used to do before on racial economic disparity. I think that a big part of the value of the blood, sweat, and tears you put on the field for a player is not just the salary, but also the opportunity to have your voice heard in an outsized way. I know it was that way for me when I was a player. 
uh, when I was talking about inner city economic development or education reform or spirituality, for these guys in this moment, they are raising their voice in a unique way. And I'm supportive of all the ways, whether it's a demonstrative protest, um, active protest, or something that is more in the community, in the weeds and moving towards um, working with partners in the community to make a difference, I'm supportive of all of them, as long as it moves us towards action. And I think that's exactly what things have done to date. So uh, we've got about 30 seconds left. Uh, two questions. What are your hopes for your first season? And um, hey, it's just between me and you. So what's the name going to be? What's the new mascot going to be? Uh, <laughs> no dice on the name. No <laughs> dice on the name. I had to try. Um, yeah, I know. No dice on the name. Um, uh, you know, the betting money, because, you know, they put a brother in the role, the betting money's on red tails. But, I, you know, not, not, I don't actually have a preference. I'm, I'm, I'm teasing. Um, but my, my hope for this season, frankly, and my eye is really firmly set on our culture, is that we are able to set on the business side a culture where people feel empowered, where they can bring their full selves, and our business operations are humming and going. And then for Coach Rivera, I, I have no doubt he's going to get us wins, and it's going to be an exciting season. All right, and the Red Tails, of course, a nod to the Tuskegee Airmen. My thanks to Jason Wright, president of the Washington NFL team. Thanks so much for joining us. Best of luck this season. Oh, thanks so much. And we're back with more Chicago Tonight Black Voices right after this. I'm Paris Schutz. Next week on Chicago Tonight, our Spotlight Politics team has the latest on the 2020 election. And Jay Shevsky introduces us to some world travelers who found out there's no place like home. That's next week at 7 here on 11. For the last 15 years, Chicagoans have explored the art of one of the city's most historic neighborhoods, thanks to a trolley. But this year, the Bronzeville Art District Trolley Tour is going virtual. Arts correspondent Angel Edo shares how six galleries on the city's south side are working to keep art relevant during the pandemic. This year, the largest African-American art district in the country is offering a virtual art tour. The district is located in Bronzeville. We have the majority or the most galleries in one area that is either walkable or can be accessed by the trolley. And we haven't found this in any other area around the country. It's a modified version of the Bronzeville Art District Trolley Tour, now virtual via Zoom. I was able to get a tour of a few of the galleries that will be included, like Gallery Gouchard. Their virtual experience will be a little bit different from the rest because they'll be showing their virtual exhibition catalogs. Our virtual exhibition catalog allows you to actually tour the gallery at your leisure, at home with your family, 24 hours a day, and you literally drop into the gallery and you can walk around and see and get close on the art and get the information about pricing. Now there is a part of the tour that isn't virtual. The Great Migration Sculpture Garden will be open for personal viewing. Artists from the Bronzeville Artist Lofts will also be a stop on the tour. That includes Raymond A. Thomas, who will not only be doing a live painting, but showcasing recent works. One of those includes one that pays homage to Bronzeville's Policy Kings, also known as the Jones Brothers. This door was from a show that we, we did here in the gallery downstairs called Echoes of Our Journey. And this actual door is a, one of the original doors from this building. I created a door celebrating the Jones Brothers. This building right here was owned by the Jones Brothers. So it's kind of like a multiple, multiple layers of history within this door. They own this building, which was the first black department store. And the next stop on my tour, the Southside Community Art Center. And while they aren't an official art gallery, they've offered context about black art in Chicago for the last 80 years. The Southside Community Arts Center was a hub. And 1940, as you know, there really was not a place for the African-American artist to come and feel comfortable, feel safe, to learn, to grow, to mentor with other artists. And the Southside Community Arts Center was that place. Other participants include Blanc Gallery, Faye African Art, and Little Black Pearl Art and Design, which will also offer different virtual exhibitions each month. Now, Guchard says it's a tradition they must continue to honor artists that have worked in Bronzeville and the neighborhood itself. 
80 years of art movements in this neighborhood, going back to the Southside Community Arts Center, to the Work Progress Administration. It speaks to the collaborations that have been going on for many years and the great art that's in this community. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Angel Ito. This month's Bronzeville Art District virtual tour is this coming Friday evening at 7. Each virtual tour takes place on the third Friday of the month through December. For those dates and more information on this story, please visit our website. And that is our show for this Sunday night. Be sure to check out our website, WTTW.com news for the very latest from WTTW News. And join Paris Shuts and me tomorrow at 7 on Chicago Tonight. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, Black Voices, I'm Brandis Friedman. Thank you so much for watching. Stay safe and healthy and have a good night. Closed captioning for this program is brought to you by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, dedicated to preserving the dignity and rights of all individuals.